Good morning, church. The title for today's sermon is Faith and Boldness. Turn to Proverbs 28. I want to thank my mom and dad. They've taught me to be a man. They've taught me to be a father. They've taught me to be a husband. But most importantly, they've taught me how to worship God. Thank you, Michael and Michelle, for bringing me up in the faith. I'm grateful that Michael did all those thank yous at the announcements because it saves me about five minutes in the sermon. So I'm going to say thank you, everyone. Amen. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked man flees, though no one pursues. Got any wicked men in the house today? Well, we got some wicked men and then we got some liars. There is no one good apart from God alone. But the Irish are as bold as lions. Now they're pretty mighty, but that's not what the scripture says. But the English are as bold as lions. But the Americans, because it's an American thing, right? The Americans are as bold as lions. The, the extroverts are as bold as lions. That's not what the Bible says. Boldness has got nothing to do with your culture, nothing to do with your upbringing, nothing to do with your personality type, nothing to do with your hormones, nothing to do with your chromosomes. It has got everything to do with righteousness. You are bold if you are righteous. The Bible says, that righteousness is a credit to those who live by faith. Living by faith is simply seeing what God says and doing it. That is what it means to live by faith. To obey the Bible when it makes no sense to obey the Bible. Righteousness produces boldness. But timidity is demonic. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says God did not give us a spirit of timidity. The word spirit in the Greek is translated 47 times in the New Testament as evil spirit. God did not give you an evil spirit of timidity. And yet some of us are timid. So where's that spirit coming from? If God is not the one giving you that spirit of timidity, it's got to be coming from somewhere. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 puts cowardice in the same relation as the sexual and immoral, the witch and the murderer. Coward is a deep, dark sin that will send you straight to hell. You say, Luke, why are you preaching so hard on cowardice? Five years ago, I was an atheist and a coward. Now I am an ex-atheist and an ex-coward. I broke up with that demon, me and him are friends no more. We don't deal with that no more. I've come to understand that cowardice is a sin like any other sin. And it should be treated as such. We're talking about faith and boldness today. Cowardice is intentionally put in Revelation 21, just like sexual immorality. If you were tempted to watch pornography, you would go and pray. You would put your phone away. You would put a blocker on your phone in the hands of your disciple. You would do righteous actions to avoid the temptation of falling into that sin. You know how you overcome cowardice? By overcoming cowardice. 
Cowardice is a temptation. You're tempted to be a coward. Doesn't mean you have to give in to that temptation. You're tempted to be non-confrontational. Doesn't mean you have to give in to that temptation. It is a sin like any other. And my Bible says that it is crouching at my door. It desires to have me, but I must master it. Do you believe that you can master cowardice? Do you believe that in the European world sector you can overcome that demonic timidity that is stopping you from sharing your faith, stopping you from going into the full-time ministry, stopping you from going after that sister and making her your wife? Do you believe that you can overcome that demon of cowardice, faith and boldness? Turn to Acts chapter 4. Let's have a look at the theme scripture for this conference. And thank you to all the other preachers for not preaching all my points over the past week's time. I was ready. I was like, okay, I'm about to rewrite my sermon a few times because everyone's going to preach my nuggets, but they didn't, so praise God. It says in verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. This is an incredible scripture. The disciples, after facing heavy persecution, decide to communicate pray. And in that prayer, they tell God to consider the threats that are being made against them. Because the disciples have already considered the threats being made against them. Are you aware of the threats that are being made against the truth in Europe? Do you understand full well that four-year-olds are being taught how to masturbate in school. Four-year-olds! Do you understand that when I went for a prayer walk the other day, I met a man who was walking his girlfriend because she believed that she was a dog. Do you understand that children do not even need to ask for permission from their parents to go to the hospital and have their gender changed. The truth is that threat. Consider these threats. We cannot ask the Lord to consider these threats if we are not considering them ourselves. Consider these threats. Now one of the most recognizable phrases in British history is the phrase, keep calm and carry on. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> keep calm. Keep calm. Carry on doing what? Yeah, carry on being a coward. Carry on. But what they won't tell you is that the origins of that slogan were not World War II. My granddad did not keep calm and carry on. My great-grandma did not keep calm and carry on. There were actually three slogans written during the time. One was, keep calm and carry on. The other was, your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. The third slogan written at the time was, Freedom is in peril. Defend it with all of your might. And what they won't tell you is that when they brought these three propaganda slogans to the government, they dismissed Keep Calm and Carry On. They said, we do not want to insult the men and women of Britain and question their integrity. Throw that poster in the bin. They only printed very few. And it was only found in the early 2000s in a bookshop in North Umbershire, and they started to print it and say it came from World War II. That is not the British spirit. That is not the European spirit. And that is not the spirit of the kingdom of God. I will not keep calm and carry on. 
My great granddad signed himself up for the special military. He was one of the first to go in the prisoner of war camps and save soldiers from the prisoner of war camps. He did not keep calm and carry on. My great grandma made bombs for the war. She did not keep calm and carry on. I will not keep calm and carry on. The apostles did not keep calm and carry on. So the European world sector will not keep calm and carry on. Jesus did not keep calm and carry on. So the movement of God will not keep calm and we not carry on. We will preach and we will fight until we die. And if you didn't break watching those flags come through this hall, you are hard hearted. You need to confess your depth of sin at the fact that that didn't break you. The thought of the evangelization of Europe, are you kidding me? What a beautiful vision. What an incredible thing. And you sat there falling asleep. Point number one, biblical conviction gives you jurisdiction. Biblical conviction gives you jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the power to make decisions and judgments. Have a look at the scriptures in Acts chapter 4. They've just healed a man crippled. And then they started to preach the word. And as they were preaching, everyone around them with no faith were offended by the words that came out of their mouth. So if you have no faith today, and if you find yourself being offended by myself, I'm sorry, maybe you're not a disciple. Peter replies in verse 8, filled with the, what kind of spirit are you filled with today? Are you filled with an unholy spirit? A spirit of tiredness? You know the disciples in Matthew 26 fell asleep because they were unspiritual? They refused to pray? I feel very awake right now. I got up at four, I had a three hour quiet time, I feel great. I don't know about those heavy eyes going on around the back. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers, elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name, no other name, no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Peter was emboldened by his thorough knowledge of the scriptures. You've got to realize that in this short passage of scripture, he quotes about six, seven different scriptures. He references Isaiah 35, about Jesus healing the cripples. He references Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, referring to Jesus coming from Nazarene. He refers to Psalm 22, the suffering servant. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Psalm 118, the capstone. Hosea 6, 2, he will rise on the third day. He is emboldened because he knows what the Word of God says. Doesn't matter what else you want to say to this man, he knows what the Bible says. How well do you know the Bible? Do they really have to get a five-year-old ex-atheist disciple to preach about faith and boldness? You're going to let a baby disciple know more Bible than you? Tell me a problem. I have a scripture. I have a scripture. Tell me what you're going through. I have a scripture. 
This thing gave me life. I will read it every day. As much as my baby allows me to. I wake up early. Because that boy of mine, man, he gets up early. I've got to be spiritual. I have the faith. I believe I can step into any situation, any city, any country. I've got my Bible. I'll figure it out. There's, do you believe that there's an answer for every single thing on the face of the earth in these words? Do you know how incredible God is? That he managed to fit the answer for everything in 66 books. No pontification, no over-explanation. Everything succinct and powerful and wise. My God is an awesome God. This is the holy word of God. Are you crazy? And this one does not include the Apocrypha for all those Catholics out there. That is not the word of God. This is the Holy Bible. I read five chapters of John back in 2018, and I was like, okay, God exists. I finished the book of John in about two days. Then I read Acts, then I just kept on reading the New Testament. I finished about the whole New Testament in my three, four week Bible study. So I was just like, this is awesome. I still feel the same way now. I can read this same scripture. I've been reading the scripture for about a week and I find new things in it every single day. Do you love God? Do you love his words? How well do you know the Bible? I love this. It says in verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. What was it about what they said that went, these, these are, these are Jesus' guys. Well, have a look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. That number didn't come out quite right. I saw you guys were confused. My mouth's a little dry, that's all. Let's see what Jesus says in verse 42. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Peter used the exact same scripture. Jesus wasn't around anymore. But Peter had his conviction cemented in the word of God. Thank you. And when Jesus went over to heaven, Peter still had his faith anchored in the scriptures. Do you know the five core convictions? Do you believe that there is only one church? Why? You been to all the other ones? Is it because Michael has told us a few times up here? Is it because someone told you in your first principles Bible studies? Or do you see it from the Holy Bible? What do you believe, church? Do you have five scriptures to back up every scripture in the first principle study? Do you believe the Bible? Have you searched it to gain faith? I don't need to go to every single church around the world. I know more scriptures than there are churches. The Bible says there is one church, one body. The Catholic one is not the one church. The Anglican church is not the one church. No Protestants, no Catholics, no Mormons, no Muslims, no Indians, no nothing. Not Indians, sorry, Hindus. Indians are definitely saved. No Hindus, no Buddhists. You think it fires us up to say there's only one church? I don't like that. I wish it wasn't true. I believe only disciples are saved. I wish that wasn't true. My grandpa died when I became a disciple. My auntie died when I became a disciple. 
think I like what it says in the Bible? Sometimes it hurts. But I believe it. And I will not change what it says in the Scriptures because it hurts. I will not change what it says in the Bible just because it's hard to accept. It's never hard to understand. If you're studying the Bible with someone and they say they don't understand, they're flat lying to your face. This is so simple. Jesus says, go and make disciples and I'll be with you. So if he's not making disciples, he's not with you. Mark 16 says, get baptized and get saved. That's so simple. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to accept. That was the issue in John chapter 6. They said, who can accept this message? Who can accept this message? Can you make a disciple? Can you lead someone from seeking God through to counting the cost? Can you answer their questions? Can you break down their strongholds with the Word of God? If you can't, and you know you can't, and you've known for a while, what are you doing about it? Stop being insecure and just read your Bible. Find the answers. You know, when Finn was younger, he's still pretty young, he's two years old. But he's a big man, I keep trying to tell you. Go greet him in the fellowship afterwards, you shake your hand. Finley Snow, Finley Clifford Snow, he's named after my great granddad that went into those prisoner war camps. Finley Clifford Snow, when we first had him, you had to shove that milk bottle in his mouth, you had to shove that food, I still have a video of his first like spoon-fed meal and it's all going down here and it's just game over. Now he won't let you touch the spoon. If you try and feed him, he'll go, And he'll put his hand out, you place the spoon in his hand, he goes, Ben Boo. <laughs> he just cranks it himself. He refuses to be fed. Because he's matured enough to realize that he can take care of those simple functions himself. You know, the issue is, Europeans think about themselves so much that it diminishes their ability to think for themselves. Too busy thinking about themselves that they can't think for themselves. I'm not saying don't get advice. I'm just saying don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Be mature enough for when your conscience is pricked by God Almighty that you go and deal with that situation. Ah, well, they're not in my church, so. Ah, well, they're not in my region, so. Ah, well, they're just from out of town, so. They're only visiting London, so. Ah. I don't think they'll take it well, so. It's true, sometimes they don't. <laughs> I disciple so many out-of-town brothers, and they look at me like I'm evil. I'm sorry, bro, you're evil ones. I'm just trying to show you the Bible. <laughs> Don't be offended. This, this Holy Scriptures, if it works in America, then it should work here too, right? It should work here too, right? Have a look at Ezekiel chapter 3. I just want to hit this one home a little bit. I really believe in this. I believe in the Bible. I think the only way we're going to be able to grow this movement around the world, no, we're growing, but we're not growing like the book of Acts. It says rapidly they grew. And I think this is part of the reason why we don't have the faith and boldness to have our own convictions on the scriptures. It says in chapter 3, verse 20, again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered. And I will hold you accountable for his blood. The Bible says if you see a disciple in sin, 
and you do not disciple them, you do not warn them where their sin will lead them, they'll die, they'll be forgotten, and so will you. It's not just for disciples. It says in verse 18, When I say to a wicked man, any wicked men in the house? Still not many, I don't know. You will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. You cannot control whether or not someone will repent, but you can control if you will. You can make the decision in that moment to have a biblical conviction that gives you jurisdiction gives you the power to make a decision and to make a judgment because that's what the Bible says. Do you defend God's righteousness? I'm a man of God. Not just when I'm in the church. Wherever I go on the streets, if I see a man shouting at a woman, I will absolutely go and talk to that man and tell him to grow up and treat women right. If I see a child being rude to his mom and the dad is not around, I will disciple that kid. I have done many times. And you know what the mom always says? Thank you. If there is a dad and a mom and their kids are back chatting, I will go speak to them both and say, do you want to do a Bible study about parenting? I've done that. Tottenham Court Road, they stood there like... I was like, yeah, your kid's... They need to be a bit more righteous. Do you need some help? Me and my wife do marriage counseling. Let's, let's get it on. Let's do it. I want to help people. I want to help people. They don't know. They don't know what they're doing is wrong. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4 here. I only got two points for you today. Point number two. Faith is foolish to the faithless. Faith is foolish to the faithless. We'll pick it back up in verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. I love this scripture. It's given me great comfort at times to know that Peter and John were unschooled and ordinary men. But as I've studied it out, my conviction has changed. They weren't unschooled and ordinary at all. They were extraordinary men. They had been taught by Jesus. That's the best school you could possibly go to. Faith and boldness says that these men considered them unschooled and ordinary. They considered them foolish for their level of faith. But they were extraordinary. And you are extraordinary. This needs to give you faith and give you boldness. I can go and you can go to any Oxford PhD theological graduate and you know far more about the Bible than they do. Far more about the Bible. Just by studying the discipleship study, you know more than every preacher, every pastor, every priest in this entire country that is not a sold out disciple. You're extraordinary. God has entrusted you, 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 you. He has entrusted you with the truth of his word. 
Luke 24 says Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He's done that for you. You understand the scriptures. You apply them to your life. You're extraordinary. Psalm 119 verse 99 says, I have more understanding than my elders, for I obey your teaching. You know because you do. You know because you do. And you don't forget if you do. I've never as a disciple sat down and memorized scripture. Now it's not wrong to do that, but I've just not seen the need. James chapter 2 says, if I continue to do it, I will not forget what I've heard. And when I preach and preach and preach and preach the scriptures, it sticks. It sticks. You've got to use the Bible to know the Bible. You've got to do the Bible to know the Bible. How well do you know the Bible? You want to tell me that you're intimidated by someone with a PhD? when they don't even know how to be saved. Confidence and arrogance are two different things. Do you believe that you're chosen by God? You know, most of you are the only disciples on your campus. Most of you are the only disciples in your workplace. Do you think that's accidental? God is so intentional. And he does not believe that you're unschooled and ordinary. But he does get a little bit ticked off when you're acting like it. When we act like we don't have the truth. When we act like we don't know exactly what the Bible says. I'm going to Ireland. I'm going to Ireland to gather the remnant. I'm going to Ireland to restore the ICOC. I'm going to Ireland to baptize the Irish and to raise up 32 evangelists to get every single county in Ireland. I believe that. I believe that the Lord has raised me up because I'm willing. Not because I'm ginger. Not because I look good in a green suit. Not because my wife is ginger. But because I'm willing. All I've said since I got baptized is yes. I'm not special apart from the spirit that's inside of me. I'm just willing. I'm just willing. Your faith should offend people. Jesus had so much faith they wanted to kill him. I want to lift up the Brussels International Christian Church. I love Guillaume. I'm so grateful to be sent out with another man of God. We're good friends, guys. We've been calling each other, talking about churches, talking about disciples, talking about babies. We want to evangelize all of Europe. This isn't about me and Guillaume. We want to go and get the whole country. We want to get the whole slice. We want Europe. And they've got faith. Guillaume became a daddy just a couple of days ago. And I bet those that are faithless among us believe that he's foolish for taking his few-day-old baby on a mission team. Take time to rest. Let your wife recover. Stay in Paris a little while. Delay the mission team. Sounds foolish to the faithless. That's a special team. I want to lift up the Dublin International Christian Church. That's my team right there. I love these guys. Just a few months ago, that team looked very different. It looked very different. I had what I thought was a sold out group of disciples. And the lawn turned up the heat. My right-hand guy turned apostate. Turned up to church with bloody knuckles. Told me he had been arrested that morning by the police. 
for having a fit of rage in it as the car park. I told him, grow up. You see my knuckles bloody? What an immature thing to do. He broke up with his girlfriend and he left Jesus. We had another sister go away, back home, manipulated by her parents, came back and lied to the sisters, saying, I'm so fired up to be back with you. Spent the night, packed her bags, left the next day. That left the brothers, the sisters, and the team devastated. I searched my Bible. I said, okay. So we're down to six. We can do a lot with six. I'd like some more. But if six is six, then let's go for it. What did Jesus do when he had fallaways? Oh, this is, Jesus is bold. When he had fallaways in John chapter six, he turned to his faithful guys and said, You guys want to go as well? So that's exactly what I did. I pulled the sister's household up to mine and Frankie's house and made them believe that I was going to cook a nice dinner. I didn't. Made them believe we were going to have a nice encouraging talk. We didn't. I said, hey, this sister fell away because this, 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 this. What sin are you in? You guys want to leave too? This is how I know it. If the household was spiritual, she'd probably still be here. So what sin's going on in the house? And every single one of them confessed, one on the other, and now they're doing awesome in that household. I had a beautiful daughter of mine who unfortunately, that apostate right hand hurt her faith. And she said, I don't know if I can come to Ireland anymore. She's my daughter. She's so special. We stood outside Bible talk. I said, I need you to come with us. And she wept. She said, I'm not worthy to come. I don't deserve it. I said, that's exactly why you need to come. Now you've got the right heart. I thought to myself, man, I'm so grateful for the team I have, but God, it would be so awesome if you helped me to raise up another individual. But Lord, let it be from you. Let it be so obvious that I did not do this. So I was like, what do I want? I want someone masculine, charismatic, talented. That'll do. So Faith Without Deeds is dead, right? So you know what I did on Instagram? I said, I'm looking for masculine, talented, and I just made my list. I was like, this is what I'm looking for. Is that you? Do you want to come and study the Bible with me? And one of the guys, his Instagram was so sketchy. It was like a topless photo of him waving locks. And he had some scriptures on his thing and no photos. I was like, this probably isn't even a real person, but let's go for it anyway. And he replies back. He's like, sure, that sounds incredible. I go, okay. Nice, cool. So like, where are you from, mate? And he said, I'm from Exeter. I was like, no way, my wife is from Exeter. I said, do you study? He's like, no, but I just graduated from Falmouth. I was like, oh my days, my wife just graduated from Falmouth. Do you want to study the Bible? And so we did this online Bible study with this guy. And we did Seeking God. And he was oh, so up for it. He was an atheist. We shared our story. And he had been traveling around all these different conferences to try and find Jesus. He found him in kind of ways and, and then just was looking for him, you know? Seeking God with all of his heart. So when he saw the challenge from the scriptures, he's like, whoa, yeah, I want to go for it. So then we met the next day. He was away at a festival. He met us out in the rain with his hood over, with his phone like this, doing a little online Zoom study, getting rained on. He's like, I just want to know the word of God, guys. I just want to know the word. In that second study, we're like, Sean, you kind of didn't seek God with all your heart. So let's do that study again. Let's, let's give you some supplementary scriptures. Then we did the word of God. Then he kind of wasn't really going after the word of God either. So I said, okay, it's make or break time, Sean. We've been meeting online. You're four hours away. The only way you're going to know what this really looks like is if you come and live with me. I know you've only known me from Instagram. 
I don't know, we've only had three hours of conversation in our entire lives. But come and move to London. He said, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> this guy, half Irish, half English, smooth, made the Dublin logo and it looks fire. At pre-service, the Sunday he gets baptized, gets told, you're going on the Dublin mission team, and he said, sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. <laughs> Sean O'Farrell is coming on the Dublin mission team. That is a true disciple. Faith and boldness. If he can do it, why can't you? If he can sign up for a mission team on the spot, why can't you? Your faith should be foolish to the faithless. And there's a lot of faithless people out here. So everyone should think you're absolutely nuts. Crazy. Bananas. You know the other day I started the car with a prayer? My wife thought I had gone clinically insane. I have got what's called a kingdom car. That's where the car key gets passed around to anyone who kind of really needs it. Trey always breaks my car. And so he's a very, I don't like his driving. I love you, Trey. I don't, it scares me. <laughs> Trey's driving my car, battery goes dead. He goes to work, gets it jump started so he can drive it back to my car park. It's dead again. I have no AA. I have no accident and emergency. Oh, that's what AA stands for. Just fine. There you go. Who knew? So I decide, you know, do you know what? God can raise Jesus from the dead. I'm going to make this car start. I'm going to pray. I believed it. I'm like, okay, honey, we're going downstairs and we're driving to the garage. This car is going to start. I'm going to pray for it. And she goes, okay, honey. <laughs> She's so submissive, even when she's like, oh, this guy's crazy, he's awesome, she's so awesome. And she came down, and I got into the car, and I got into the passenger seat, and I clicked, and clicked, and clicked, nothing. And Frankie didn't even get in the car. She stood there. And I turned it, and I turned it. And I turned it, and then I stopped turning it for a second. I was like, God, can you kind of help me out for a second? So my wife thinks I'm crazy. Can I know you can do it, so why are you messing? Like, come on. Like, I had no doubt that he could do it. I just wondered if he was gonna. So I'm turning, I'm turning. This guy comes walking into the parking lot. And Frankie knocks on the car. She says, honey, sh shall we ask that man? So I got out of the car. My faith already said no, but I, I put my head out. And he said, why don't you call the AA? And I'm like, nah. <laughs> my wife said, do you have a car? He said, no, I'm just walking my dog. I was like, thank you, God. So I went back in my car, popped the trunk, opened it up, went to the battery and went. <laughs> I thought that would work. Faith and deeds. I got back into my car. And I sought the seatbelt light. I turned the car and the car turned on. I was cracking up. That was me and my God. I said, do, do this for me, Dad. And I'll say it, give me a soul, Dad. Give me conviction, Dad. Change my heart, Dad. Give me the faith to go on a mission team, Dad. Give me boldness, Dad. And he will. And a thousand times over, he will answer that prayer. Faith is foolish to the faithless. You've got to be okay with everyone thinking you're nuts. You've got to be bold and shameless. Following footsteps of the blameless. Pick up your cross. Drop your ego and prepare to be nameless. Fight the battles in private so you can be doubtless, fearless, and save the hopeless. This world is restless. 
careless. They have no heaven, they're homeless. Men are boneless. Preachers have no salt, their sermons are tasteless. Politics and social movements are useless. And life without Jesus is meaningless, pointless. Nevertheless, we will profess, confess our sin and address everyone else's. Obsess over him or else we will be armorless, arrowless, soulless and faithless. His blood made us stainless. Our sword for the Lord and our sword for our leaders. It's time to fight because the next life is endless. To God be all the glory. Please calm down the way you were with